So, I mean, like, your situation is the same with us. It's like we are being used and we are being pushed to that situation that maybe, uh, if in any case, I hope not, I really hope not, that a military outbreak, it may come from our side. So that, that, that is a very problematic situation, really. And I'm afraid. And I'm, of course, we're advocating, people like me right now are advocating that, you know, the Philippines should not be uh, a pawn in, in this dynamics that um, the United States has with its with adversity to a greater extent. And that would include Russia and, and China to, to some extent. And we are trying to say, like, you know, um, we don't benefit from all of these things. And we are compromising our economic, very good economic relationship with China. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies. And today I'm hosting a panel with two colleagues to do a comparative discussion about two cases that strike me as remarkably similar, but in two very different conflict theaters. We will compare the security policies of the Philippines with those of Finland. Both countries used to have a more or less independent security approach, but recently decided to give up that uh, those, those policies for the sake of military integration with the United States-led security blocs. To discuss this, I've got with me uh, a colleague from the Philippines, Anna Rosario uh, Malindokui from the Institute of South-South Cooperation and Development at Peking University, and a Finnish colleague, Dr. Tuomas Malinen, who's an associate professor at the University of Helsinki and the CEO and the chief economist of GNS Economics. We also had planned to have Warwick Powell here, who might join us in the in the meantime. But for now, it's the three of us. So, uh, Anna and Thomas, welcome. Thank, Thank you, Pascal, for inviting us uh, for this discussion. I'm very excited to have a discussion with us and to learn more about the Finland situation and how it's similar to our situation in the Philippines. Thank you, and hi, Thomas. Hello. It's yeah, yeah, it thanks, thank, yeah. Thanks for having me too. It, it's actually funny. Like I wrote yesterday, I, I have very little knowledge on what's happening in the, in the Philippines. So it's it will be a, um, a truly uh, what's the word interactive discussion uh, during which I hope to learn quite a bit. We we should we should actually start with this. Can I ask each one of you to give a short expose of how what the secu your security strategies at Philippines and and uh, Finland used to look like, and then how they transitioned over the last couple of just a few years uh, into being more or less completely completely the opposite of being completely integrated with US-led blocks. Can I ask Anna first and then Thomas, give us a rundown, please. Yeah, and that would I thank you for that, Pascal. Um, as you can see, during the previous administration of former president Rodrigo Duterte, um, he pursued a foreign policy that is independent, meaning it, it, it tried to strike a balance between major powers in the Indo-Pacific region, and that would include China, the United States. Of course, you can see that there's a presence a very much felt presence of the United States in in the in the in the Asia Pacific region because of, of of its pivot to Asia foreign policy that what started during Obama's time. So during President Duterte's time, he was really trying to strike a balance and make the our position neutral and independent in many ways. Trying to you know that you know our foreign policy that time was centered on our national interest and what is the national interest of the country. Of course, it includes peace, diplomacy, and political settlement of dispute in a peaceful manner and a diplomatic manner. And at the same time, of course, to have that economic development and prosperity. Because my country, the Philippines, is not as like you know as an economic um, power in that sense. It's struggling in many ways, but. During the thirties time, our economic development was very good because of that foreign policy. And in a way, during the time, we were able to capitalize our good relation with China. So we got a lot of investment in terms of infrastructure and many other things, even agriculture and even tourism was really good. I mean, there were a lot of Chinese visiting the Philippines. So in a way, we have the dispute in the South China Sea during his time, and even until now, but still that dispute with China and with other claimant states during the thirties time was pretty much um stable and we were able to manage that we avoid skirmishes in that disputed area so that was i mean the the the, the situation of the philippines 
um, vis-a-vis the United States was okay in a sense that we are, you know, we are a traditional ally of the of the of the United States because we have the mutual defense treaty of 1951, but what ratified in 1952, we have the visiting forces agreement, we had the EDGAR, the enhanced development agreement, which is basically like um security and defense agreement that we had with the United States. And all of this was in place, but even then there was I mean, Duterte, I think, was trying to make um, that move to to have that distance, equidistance between um, um, the United States and China and even Russia and other powers in, in, in playing in the region. However, um, that was really um, stable, I would say. And we are not within the ambit of what you call um, United States um, security and defense um and infrastructure and structure, uh, security architecture in the in the Indo-Pacific region. Though we are an ally, but there was a calibration, recalibration of that kind of relationship. So pretty much stable. We don't have problem with Russia. We don't have problem with that with China. We have a very good relationship with these major powers. However, when the, when when there was a transition, of course, um, in our system, in our political system, the president will only have one term, and that's six years. So after six years, there's a change of leadership. There was an election, and and Marcos Jr. came into power. And but the, the thing here is the tricky part of that is during the election, Marcos Jr. was saying that he will continue that independent foreign policy and a balanced foreign policy foreign policy for the Philippines. But after six months, roughly, not even six months, I think, there was a shift in foreign policy. And from a very independent, from a independent foreign policy, it becomes like a foreign policy that's very much leaning to the United States. It's like a beholden foreign policy to the United States in a way that it's like a militarized foreign policy because after six months of his leadership, only six months, no, he has six years to, uh, he has actually four years to go or roughly more than roughly more than four years to go because, yeah, he had just shown a last week. Um, that foreign policy shifted. It becomes very leaning to the United States. And one manifestation, uh, one of the biggest manifestations of that is what you call the, the additional EDGA sites or military bases, U.S. military bases in, in, in the country right now that's be, that's ongoing and, you know, and it's being installed. So there's also the enhancement of, in we have the so-called expanded EDGA. So expanded EDGA, EDGA is very critical because it 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 does not talk about installation of military bases in our own Philippine military bases, but it also talks about prepositioning of military assets in the region. And then there was already Balikatan earth exercises, the joint military earth exercises between Philippine forces and American forces that before during Duterte time, Duterte avoided it at all. Really, he tried to diffuse it and avoid. But this time, it becomes more escalated, heightened. And we had biggest military air exercises with the, with the United States. And this kind of situation and this kind of change of foreign policy and defense foreign policy. And also we had also a strengthening of defense and security pol um, security pack or, or, or ties with Australia, well, with the allied of, allies of the United States in the region, with South Korea, with Japan even. So this is the situation. There's So there's a shift, really a shift. And the problem with this kind of shift is like this. Um, we are in a way, in some way, antagonizing a major power in the region, and that's China, and it's very evident in the way we pos uh, in the way the current administration of Marcos Jr. is positioning itself, even in, in terms of pronouncement. So this is creating some kind of tension, not only between China and the Philippines, but even within the ASEAN region. And ASEAN member states are not happy about this because as much as possible i think what asean wants is a more stable region and 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 also the prepositioning of military assets the proliferation of different um different and to a certain extent some um um defense and security pact between the united states and the philippines um between um um, the Philippines and Japan, RAA, and between um, Australia and the Philippines, and and all of these allies, and 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 trying to put the Philippines to a certain extent with the perception of ASEAN member states or even ASEAN counterparts looking at us as 
probably the next Ukraine and Asia is very much evident. Yeah. So people like me are kind of worried about the, our situation. And I'm not sure if in any case, um, Marcus Jr. will really reshift and, 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 and reshift its foreign policy and strike a balance at this time. Because as you can see, last Monday, um, Austin and Blinken just visited us and even saying that they will, the United States will again pour in money around 500,000 US dollars for militarization of my country. So this is critical situation because as much as possible, we don't want to have another Ukraine crisis in Asia out yeah. of the Philippines vis-a-vis -vis China. Yeah, I don't think that, yeah. When you compare that now to what's happening in, in, in Finland, Thomas, can you tell us what how you react to this, hearing this and, 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 and comparing it to what's happening in Finland? This is rather unbelievable. Like I said, I, I, I have no idea. I have very little idea of what is like, um, what is go, uh, what has been going in the Philippines. The, the developments are eerily similar. Like it's really, it's, whoa, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a bit blown away. But in Finland, like after the World War, Second World War, uh, we quickly kind of created a position of new, neutrality. Uh, we in, in Ford, um, was it May or May 1948? We signed the treaty on it's you on a finish, so it's it's cooperation, assistance, or whatever. But it basically stated that Finland will stay as an independent nation and it will defend all attacks towards Russia or then Soviet Union through Finland by its own, own, uh, own means with possible assistance from the Soviet Union. And this was uh, kind of a strike of genius from our, our, our president, I think it was basically back then, anyway, that it kept us out of all alliances. Uh, uh, NATO, which was formed in 1949, uh, but, but most importantly, the Warsaw Pact, which was formed a few years later. So Finland created this doctrine of being between East and the West. And just to say that it, it was really difficult for Finland to begin with or after the Second World War because we we were allied with Nazi Germany. We were outside every single like uh, 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 Western agreement for years. There was even all close. Uh, we we were we were really close to famine, for example. It was a really difficult time, and they managed our leadership managed in a really narrow path to a position of neutrality between the Soviet Union and, and, the, um, and the U.S. and the, um, the Allies. But the, the positive thing came from that, that uh, because we were not in these Western alliances, which heavily sanctioned Soviet Union or Russia, we could trade with them. And we, we created a very prosperous Eastern trade. With, with Soviet Union or Russia back then, while we were strengthening our military. Like there was this, I was in a, uh, there was a mandatory military service in Finland. So I was in the armored brigade. And I think the, uh, the Par Paris Accord or the, well, the peace treaty that was signed after the Second World War, I think the state that we could have like 270 tanks. Like, uh, and they, uh, well, I, while I was serving in the, Armored Brigade. There was a rumor. Uh, um, I was an honor surgeon, but anyway, there was a rumor that there's a a a, a um, cave, let's say, when there's a lot of tanks without the turrets, in which don't fall into the the agreement. So okay, so that was the point that Finland Finland did not make herself as a threat to Russia and, and form these like very good uh, trade relations with Russia. That was the key idea. Do not make yourself a threat, but make yourself as a bitter pill to swallow. So if so Soviet Union knew if they attack, the costs will be massive. So that was the whole idea. And it was very prosperous relationship. We, we Finland strived, really strived. Economical, economically since 1950s and uh, until early 1990s. But then there was a change when the Soviet Union broke up. So we, we got closer to NATO. Uh, um, 
uh, in different treaties in 94 and, uh, and then 2014. I don't remember the name of the treaties. But the biggest change came when the Ukrainian conflict uh, escalated in a full-blown war. And we were basically taken into NATO without asking the population anything. And for decades, especially after the fall of the Soviet Union, there was a clear understanding that if there would be, if Finland would apply to the North uh, Atlantic Treaty Organization, there would be a referendum. Nothing was held. And then there was the DC agreement uh, uh, signed just not Can you say not what the DC agreement ago. is? A defense cooperation agreement with the USA. And I, I, that is something I needed to ask Anna. Do they have the same? But let's talk about yeah, the same. Yeah, have that. the same. You have the same, yeah, okay. On our side, it's it's called Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement that's supposed oh. to be expired. Um, it was signed during Aquino's time, the the the, the Aquino the third. That's April twenty fourteen, and then this April, last April, it should be renewed or abrogated. But there was not even a transparency as to that. And as you, I have said to you, we have four additional Edgar bases that's causing anxiousness on the part of China because these are facing Taiwan and some of it are facing the South China Sea. So we oh, kind no. of have a similar situation, I think. Yeah, and the, the DC agreement for Finland. Is is like even stronger, isn't it? 16 bases. No, uh, 16 or 15, I think it was 15. 15, 15, 15. And I just, I just read the other day, I just read through that what we know, what is the public. There's, of course, a secret part, which we don't know about, but the public part. And it's, it's yeah, US has a lot of leeway of uh, what it, what stuff it brings into the country. And there is, there is no clear denying or or there's no um they i think the, how the people are reading it the u.s could even bring nuclear weapons to finland we have a treaty that or a, a law in place that forbids that but no one is sure does it apply to these bases and the thing is that if you if you bring middle range weapons to these bases saint petersburg is just right there it's like 200 kilometers from the border it's just there. The second biggest city, the, the holy city of Russia, so to speak. And yeah, so, but the, the thing with the, uh, it, uh, one thing I have to mention, because things got really crazy when our president, Alexander Stup, signed a defense agreement with Ukraine. This was just a few months ago. It was completely unheard of. The last time Finland signed a treaty, uh, with a country in a war against Russia was in June 1940. Thomas, Thomas, sorry, your your audio just broke off. Anna, do you still hear him? I can't hear him. You yeah. cannot, right? Yes. Yeah. Something. Thomas, can you speak again? Okay. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, there's something. That I have this like okay. Well, my mic went off for some reason. I think it okay. ran out of battery. But I hear you well. We hear you well. Okay. Okay. Good. Can anyway, you start so again now, from the place where you were talking about uh, uh, the, the the agreement with Ukraine? Agreement with yeah, Ukraine. Yeah. So yeah. So last time we had an agreement, uh, we signed an agreement with the with the country in a war against Russia was in 19, in June nineteen forty four. When our then president Risto Ruti sent a letter to Adolf Hitler, basically stating that, um, avowing that, promising that Finland will not seek a, a kind of peace with Soviet Union separately from Nazi Germany. That's the last time. And now we have a defense, this defense agreement with Ukraine. It makes absolutely no sense. Like, what's the, what, what, what's the benefit of Finland? And there is all, even a, a constitutional law office I have been consulting during the past three years. And when I talk with them, they said that it's really difficult to understand that if there would not, if there would become a war because of this treaty, how this would not be a high treason. So Finnish law on high treason says that it doesn't take any stand on any foreign conflicts. It just says that any action that 
will aim at getting Finland involved in these foreign conflicts is a high treason. So how how can these people sign these things? So we have the NATO, we have the DCA, we have the Ukraine agreement. And the thing is that the Ukraine agreement, the parliament just issued a statement. They didn't even vote for it. We didn't have any discussion. Like we basically didn't have on the DCA. And there was not a single member of the parliament actually objecting the DCA. This makes no sense. Like, we, just, just let me finish. We had the Pasiki with De- Kekun and Doctrine named uh, uh, um, um, according to a former president. It, it, it was just the same thing I mentioned that do not make a threat to Russia. Be friendly, do not make a threat, but make yourself a bitter bit swallow. And now these have completely thrown away. S- similarly, as it seems in, in Philippines, we have turned from a a neutral partner, a kind of um, semi-friend of Russia to an aggressor. This makes absolutely no sense. And this has come through the US. So what is the point of boxing in both Russia and China? Who is, what? They, They are like, this is like, this is nothing else than a preparation for a war. And my contacts from the Finnish military tell me that there have been full-blown preparations for war since we joined NATO, since we joined the agreement. They are preparing actually for an actual war with Russia. And, uh, it makes no sense. This is completely insane. And, uh, we, have, just... We, have, we have no problems with the Russians. We Like in the eastern part of Finland, we had 1,340 kilometers border with them. And Russians and Finns, there's a, a, I think 80, over 80,000 Russians living here. We, we, are, we are kind of bonded. The nations have already bonded in the eastern part. We have zero problems with them. They're, they're, they're different people, but they, re, but they really respect Finns. There's, there's, no, there's nothing uh, malevolent between Finnish and Russian populace. This is purely political driven. And, and this is another this is another similarity, isn't it, Anna? Like the peoples, like yes. Chinese and Filipinos, and the trade links relationship between them is very deep. Can you take it? Uh, can Can you react? Yeah, yeah. To this? I, 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 it's it's completely like um a mind boggling for me. The Finland situation is quite very similar to our situation in the Philippines. First and foremost, even the issue that you know you don't know if there's um preposition nuclear weapons in your country. In the same manner, also in the Philippines is like that. Because as you can see, even it took President Putin to even um pointed out in his July 28 meeting with his defense ministers. I think it was a, it's a security meeting with all of his security forces and generals in, in, in Russia, saying that we took note of the Philippines. That it uh, that the United States deployed some kind of mid-range missiles, and actually yeah. there was a deployment during the Balikatan Earth exercises last April uh, and around March, and until now it's there the, the the launcher, and we even have this suspicion. I mean, like for me, I'm thinking. So there is, is there a possibility that there's already a nuclear weapon in my country in EDCA basis? EDCA stands for Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement. As I have said earlier, um, it's supposed to be, there should be supposed to be a transparency if EDCA has been renewed or not. Because after 10 years, EDCA is subject to a discussion for renewal or not. But the current government of Marcos Jr. does not even... Um, tell the public that, you know, we already renewed. But of course, we have an assumption that it's renewed already because you have four additional EDGA bases. These EDGA bases are basically military bases, a U.S. military bases inside our own military bases of, in the country. And it's already a total of nine, nine EDGA. But that is the de jure. De jure meaning that is the proclaimed ones. There is a bit of discussion every now and then that there is even a de facto of 17, around 17 de facto um. 17, a total of 17 EDCA bases slash a military bases, American military military bases in the country, but it's only like the nine that is um, declared so, to so a greater extent because you have um, 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 a, a location in my country, um, Bataan, that is now being, um, uh, the, the presence of the Americans there is very evident and it's not even declared as EDCA base or EDCA site, but it's very near 
Taiwan. So if you really look at the Finland situation vis-a-vis -vis Russia, our situation is very similar vis-a-vis -vis China. And mm. there is this, um, 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 it has been there out there already that there is like a war games going on even before that, you know, um, that United States wants to have that war with China. But it's just that um, during my, during the presidency of former um, Rodrigo Duterte, um, we were not, included in that war games we were not included as part of the what you call um perimeter the defense perimeter or the countries that is that that will be used by the united states in in, mm. in any case there's an event of conflict a military conflict or outbreak in the in the pacific region because during the time duterte doesn't want to have any kind of prepositioning of military assets in the country, especially nuclear weapons. But at this time, because of the change of foreign policy, I think we are already part of that defense perimeter or that what you call um, countries um, allied by the United States that would include Japan, South Korea, you have Guam the near first Hawaii. first island chain. Yeah, island chain. Yeah, the, the, the first island chain. So we are already part of it, I think, because you have the additional EDCA bases, and also you have preposition of military assets, you have the deployment of mid-range missile launcher in the northern part of Luzon, and and it was already um it's in the news um they were able, i think the, the 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 security forces in my country um was pressured to to say that there is such a thing and now lately just 2 days ago or yesterday i mean our foreign secretary um uh, Manalo, the the defense, uh, the foreign secretary of my country, is saying that you know that this defense, um, uh, this mid-range missile launcher is okay because this is not intended for any country, but it's on it's for the defense of the of the Philippines and China is reacting to it because China is saying like you know if you have this kind of military assets in your country deployed by the United States, it creates some kind of an atmosphere in the region that. Other countries may do um, arms. There, it it can provoke an arms race in the region, and that is not good for the region. And even Putin already took the uh, already spoke about these things. So I mean, like your situation is the same with us. It's like we are being used and we are being pushed to that situation that maybe, uh, if in any case, I hope not. I really hope not that a military outbreak it may come from our side. So that, that, that is a very problematic situation, really. And I'm afraid. And I'm, of course, we're advocating, people like me right now are advocating that, you know, the Philippines should not be uh, a pawn in, in this dynamics that um, the United States has with its with adversity to a greater extent. And that would include Russia and, and China to, to some extent. And we are trying to say, like, you know, um, we don't benefit from all of these things. And we are compromising our economic, very good economic relationship with China. If yeah. you look at my country, economically speaking, it's really suffering economically. I have to mention this. Uh, there, Two weeks ago, there was a big military uh, drill just 10 kilometers out of the southeastern border with Russia alongside the road that leads to St. Petersburg. This is a major military drill of all exercise with with uh, with the US. I, I there is only one phrase I can put to this. It's what the fuck. It doesn't it's just these are provocations. And like Anna said, this is I'm I have become worried not of Russia attacking Finland, it makes no sense, but NATO attacking mm -hmm. Russia through Finland and Douglas McGregor, Colonel Douglas, Douglas McGregor, issued a statement yesterday because there was a uh, strike to uh, Russian military uh, air base in in very close to Finnish border in, in in up north basically, and Colonel McGregor hinted that the drones would have came from Finland. At least their guidance to the place uh, should would probably need to have came, come from Finland. Ukrainian drones or Finnish drones. This is extremely dangerous situation also here. And the no, common denominator seems to be that the US military, I don't I don't say the US because I don't think US populace wants this. US military complex is pushing for escalation with Russia. There is there really is no other conclusion 
we can make. And let's remember that according to several sources from Turkey, from US, United States and the UK torpedoed the uh, truce agreement between Ukraine and Russia in April 22. So there is a this global, global, there seems to be this global push for mm. a, a, a actually World War Three is the only, only thing to put it. So I, I've been asking myself, who is pushing for this? May May I just add to this one that where what what combines actually the three Philippines, Finland, and Ukraine is this moving away from neutrality and moving away from having a position where you are a buffer. And I need to give you one quote by uh, Finland's former. Uh, Prime Minister Uro Kekkonen, who was one of the most brilliant statesmen of the 20th century, he oh, said, president. Uh, president. "President, sorry, president." He said, "I quote: When all is said and done, neutrality is by no means the easiest foreign policy. It's easier to be to obey than to stand in one on one's own feet. Neutrality cannot be pursued passively, and there is no simple formula which will always and unfailingly give the desired answer, regardless of situation and circumstances." Is it laziness? Is it laziness that suddenly elites just let go and say, like, fine, then we, we're going to do what the U.S. says? I don't, th I, I don't think it's laziness. It's, this, is done, this, this, is, has been, this is done on purpose for motives, I don't know. But I don't know. Do you think differently, Anna? I think it's laziness, no? I think there are a lot of reasons to it. Um, on our side, the Philippines, I think um, Marcus Jr. has probably personal reasons to it, why he's doing this and why he's beholden to the United States. And also, politically speaking, if you really look at the domestic politics in the Philippines right now, there's a big challenge. Um, I mean, the, the leadership of, of, of President Marcos Jr. is challenged by many people because of the so many domestic problems that the country is facing. And also, the so many allegations being thrown at his administration, including an allegation that he is somewhat using an... Uh, an illegal, so, uh, uh, he's like somewhat um, using a substance that is not supposed to be used by any person for that matter. So it's like illegal drugs to a greater extent. There are allegations as to that. The economy, the corruption, and even one of the major allegations is this situation that we are being put, well, we are being situated and we are being used as a pawn or a proxy of the United States vis-a-vis -vis its geopolitical rivalry and competition in the Asia Pacific region with China. And even now Russia is coming in because of that mid-range missile launcher that is now deployed in, in the northern part of the Philippines. And one more issue that makes things complicated for our side in the Philippines is like this. Um, um, the, the United States before, probably last year, was lobbying the, the, the Philippine government to, to accept 50,000 Afghan refugees from Afghanistan because they left Afghanistan. And there are a lot of um, Afghans who were like working with the United States during the time that they were there. So these Afghans probably are under prosecution or under some kind of stress. So now the United States last year was lobbying that this Af 50,000, around 50,000 Afghan refugees, if I'm not mistaken, to be deployed or to be housed in, in, in the Philippines, in, in the in the Subic area or in area of former um, um, naval bases of the of, of the Americans during the time of that there was still a really a literal military basis in 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 by the Americans in the in the country. So now it's another issue because some of the, there was no transparency as to this regard. But even then, um, some friends of uh, there are you know speculation that this kind of lobby from the United States is already approved by the current president. By, by President Marcus Jr. And the, the, the thing here is that we're worried about this, if it's in any case, it's approved already, is these are not, we, we don't believe that these are just Afghan refugees. We even have this perception that maybe these are ISIS also or terrorist people who are now being housed because we cannot discount the fact that ISIS actually originated and being the, the initial instigation of ISIS, it was the United States who actually funded it and created it in some ways. So in, in our side, we have this kind of dilemma, additional dilemma, that what if this lobby of the United States is approved and you have this 
situation that the country is being pushed to be the uh, proxy uh, of the United States and its competition and even its military um, whatever plans, it may be a, a war that is that has been discussed and even before with China. So these are problems, real problems that the Philippines is facing that, you know, it was, um, it's really like crazy that from a very neutral, because during President Duterte's time, we have, we position ourselves because we are always been an ally of the United States and very much leaning to the United States. But during the presidency of Duterte, to a greater extent, and to a big change that this is really what this was a big change our country was positioned to a neutral mm. position that you know we will be we will have an equidistance with all superpowers and our mantra during duterte presidency was friends to all and enemy to none but this current administration is putting us in a situation that you know a foreign policy leading to the united states with all the defense pack and security pack that is coming in including the including the the, the pack with japan which is reciprocal access agreement which is prepositioning of deployment of troops in my country japanese troops and even exchanges of military assets and japan is an ally of the united states so in a way this is really crazy because we are afraid that if in any case we will be in the same way with Finland that we uh, uh, something like an attack or a, or a spark in the Asia Pacific region will be coming from our side, um, and that is not for my country in 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 every possible way. Thomas, oh, and then I need to add something. Thomas first. <laughs> yeah, I, I was just yeah, I was just thinking what Anna was saying. I, I'm just doesn't seem doesn't it seems really strange that this all has come like. From the flip of the switch, mm. every everything globally. And mm. do you remember after what event the the Ukraine crisis escalated? Olympics. They mm. ended on the. Oh. Uh, I don't remember the date, but it was like two days after the you know Russian troops moved in, into Ukraine, and now we have the Olympics again. And in European history, the um, uh, the um, the invasions of Russia from Europe have started between 22nd of June and, and uh, what the, well, the, well, the first, Second World War started the 1st of September. So we, in, in historically speaking in Europe, we're now in the corridor of escalation here. Mm -hmm. And I have started to wonder that what will happen after the Olympics in, in Paris ends. But the thing is that this flip of a switch thing we should really ponder. And now, now I, I didn't have this information on the Philippines before. Now I have it. And I'm rather certain that this is the U.S. military industrial complex which is pushing mm -hmm. this. There may be some force behind it, but the same complex that Eisenhower warned in, in 1962 in his farewell speech. And it's funny that he U.S. president warns that this is this military industrial complex that is trying to take control of foreign policy and possibly even larger fraction of, of U.S. economy. And no one has spoken of it since. It's like buried. It's it's like us, like critical conspiracy theorists or something. We we talk about it, but it lacks. Like it's 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 something that is hidden. But now, now it just clicked when I was listening to Anna that the same entity is pushing for this escalation there toward China and here towards Russia. And the thing with missiles, you know, if not, if they are not like anti-tank missiles, they are not defense weapons. They're attack mm. weapons. So yes, I and anyone making such an argument that no, that we have this mid-range system which fires like what? 1,000 to 5,000 5, kilometers away. Like it is not, it, it's an attack system. Mm designed to attack to another country like it just, yeah this and this thing that they, they have been this narrative they have been pushing in in europe which is basically that war is peace yeah. it's the same thing that was said before the world uh, world war one i was about just, to, i was about to add that we are we we are seeing an escalation spiral which actually bit by bit takes out the neutrals first puts them in line in alliances, and then you just, you need a spark and it all goes up in flames. Mm. 
The, yeah. the thing is, of course, that there are counter arguments. And I need to give this to both of you. Anna, to you it is the Chinese are very aggressive in the South China Sea and they are occupying features that belong to the Philippines under international law recognized UNCLOS 2016. And the, the, the Chinese are very, are very pushy. Of course, the, the Philippines is threatened. And to almost to you, it's uh, Russia just invaded Ukraine. Of course, Russia is threatening. If you are a direct neighbor, you should be threatened because you should be scared uh, uh, since that just happened. Uh, I, I'm not first and then talk. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, let me. I, I had one thing, Pascal. Let's let's push five to ten minutes further than I said. This is so okay. important. Let's go. Yeah. Okay, okay. But yeah, I'm not first. Okay. Um. One thing that I have to clarify when you talk about the South China Sea dispute, one, one thing that is very important to put it out there, the South China Sea dispute is not just a dispute between the Philippines and China, okay? It is a dispute with other claimant states, and Vietnam is very aggressive even in the South China Sea. When you talk about occupied islands, Vietnam occupied a lot compared to China and even to my country. And I don't really see that my country... I mean, we the China is our enemy just because we have a dispute over the South China Sea. Because as you can see, there's already an example that we can manage the dispute in a peaceful and diplomatic manner during the Duterte administration. The whole six years of Duterte administration, we did not experience skirmishes to the point that probably a miscalculation would happen on the ground or a military outbreak in the South China Sea will happen. That never happened during Duterte's time. Precisely because we were able to calibrate our relation, there was an open communication there was no block in terms of communication. Our government during the 30 time was very open in communicating and trying to discuss with the Chinese counterparts how to manage the dispute in a way that we avoid the skirmishes and the security and the peace and stability of the South China is maintained because it's very... I mean, the South China dispute is very complicated. It's not between the Philippines and China. It is between other claimant states as well. And you have other players in there. But the problem is the intervention coming from the United States. It intervenes in the South China Sea dispute. And it is not a party to the dispute. And it's just because it wants to have that so-called open and Indo-Pacific open sea or open Indo-Pacific region, justifying it in that way when in fact it's all about its military warship that has a free lane in, in roaming around the South China Sea without any complaint from other regional states. That is impossible because there's no block when you talk about commercial ships. But when you talk about military ships, I think the United States has to be very careful and has to pay respect as well because this is not anymore and, and because of the tension going on in 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 that area and it's disputed so on as far as i'm concerned i don't see china as an enemy we will be able to communicate with them and resolve the dispute in a way that is diplomatic and peace and on our side it's not an advantage for the philippines in in whatever sense to have that deployment of mid-range missile in the country and i i and i agree with thomas it's not a defense it, it's not for our defense. It's actually a preparation for an attack to whatever to wh whoever country. It's not a defense because mm -hmm. I don't see my country having an enemy at all. We don't have an external enemy. Our enemy is internal. Our problems in, in um in terms of insurgency, local insurgency, in terms of, of economic hardship. These are our enemies and food security. These are our enemies. We need to conv to solve this. But external enemy, I don't see it really. And China, I don't see China as an, our enemy. Our history with China goes back beyond, goes back even before the colonization time. We already have partnership, we have business, we already trade with China. So uh, China is our neighbor and it, we cannot change it. As far as foreign policy is concerned, we need to deal with China because geography tells us that we cannot change geography. So we need to have that. And I can see that the Chinese, I think, are open when you talk about how to resolve the conflict in the South China Sea. And there are there is the so-called ASEAN level in the multilateral sense to you know to 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 facilitate some kind of negotiation with China over this dispute. So that is the situation. So my question even is, why is it that my country is being militarized by the United States? What's the purpose of it? When in fact, as far as we are concerned, we don't have an enemy. A China is not our enemy. It's our friend. We have a dispute. We have a conflict. But there are other ways of resolving that. So the question basically bottom line that the same question that Thomas is asking, who is dictating? Why is it that my country is being militarized by by the United States, by deploying all of these as military assets. And also, it's not only military assets, I am telling you. There are a lot of American troops in my country. 
I, I even saw one milit one American using the uniform of our National Bureau of Investigation when in fact that is not supposed to be the case because a foreigner cannot use the official uniform of our security forces. But it's happening in my country. There's a lot of them there. So that is the basic question. Bottom line, there are people, maybe government or even entities that wants to have World War III, which is not good for the world. And I hope this could be prevented. And I, I from my country, is really trying our best to educate our own people that we cannot allow this to happen and we cannot allow the Philippines to be a pawn and even to be the, 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 you know, the, the spark that will create this kind of military outbreak in our side of the of the world, which is the Asia Pacific. I don't think so. I don't think also the Asian countries will would would want to have that kind of situation. I don't think so. Thomas. Yeah, there is a I remember a great great quote from a uh, Joseph Stalin, the former leader of Soviet Union. He told our president Pasigiv that you cannot change geography, geography, and neither can you. So that's it. And uh, yeah, the, the thing is here also that like Russia has been an aggressor for 500 years, going wars around its borders, which have changed a lot during the 500 years. Karelian Peninsula, which con uh, connects Finland and Russia in, in, the, uh, in the southeast part of Finland, has been one of the bloodiest places in Europe over the years. But Finland has no problems with hadn't had haven't had no problems with Russia since I don't know forty eight. Russians are not our enemy, and the point of point if looking at from the Russian point of perspective, let's let's say that why uh, let's think that why would they attack their their eastern neighbor with with a friendly eastern neighbor with one of the strongest if not the strongest army in europe it would have made absolutely no sense so we were not a threat to russia in any way but they knew that there is no point of you know uh, uh having this conflict here so we were safe we were completely safe before nato but nato of course wants the Finnish military, because it's it's the best uh, best trained, best equipped military in, in Europe, basically, not the largest, but the best trained and equipped. So, yeah, so they wanted. We were not a threat. They wanted us, and they got us without even asking the population whether we want to go in or not. And so the same question applies. Why is the U.S. military industrial complex? militarizing our country against Russia. And this is a this is the one thing I heard. I think this is the best one of the best quotes uh describing the situation in, in Ukraine, Russia versus US was my American friend told me a year and a half ago that I don't I don't did I say it in the first interview with Pascal I'm not sure but he's he told me that if Mexico would be joining a military alliance with Russia and would be shelling Texas there would be no Mexico, no more. U.S. would have leveled it. And every single U.S. Per American I have spoken into, uh, uh, spoken with this, uh, 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 to whom I have told this line, professors or laymen or whatever, no one disagrees. U.S. U the US military industrial complex is the aggressor of the world now. It and combined with the C CIA. There is the, they are the aggressor. There are other aggressors, you know, China and Russia, they are they are all geopolitical players. But the most aggressive one is the United States. Now I have seen it in with my own eyes in this country that I really love, and I don't want us to turn into the next Ukraine. My colleagues, I think that is something that we can agree on. The question is, how do, you, do we wrestle our countries away out of the fangs of this monster? Because even Switzerland is going the same route. If you look at the elite uh, uh, white papers and so on that are, that are being written, I mean, if you look at the white papers that are written by certain elites, there is something that's capturing us, the neutrals. And it, mm -hmm. it puts us into camps and it makes sure that we become usable. Mm -hmm. This is what happened to Ukraine. And it will I have, have uh, yeah. I have. There's a very simple solution for Finland out of this. 
we we assign a second UUA with Kremlin, with Russia. We say that we do not, on a, under any circumstances, attack to Russia, but we do defend our territorial territorial in integrity in all ways, in every way. We do not. So we we basically sign a a, a uh, what is what is the word? It is so much finished, but we we sign a treaty with Russia that we will not engage any military action against Russia, and even when Russia. it's a member of NATO. Yeah, so we just do that. And I think this whole problem in in, uh, in the Northern Europe disappears for, with, with that treaty. But do we sign it? Of course we do not. Because I think the idea is bring war to Finland. Everything points to that. And it makes no... It, it's there's nothing good for Europe, for Finland, for the world in it. So again, we have to ask who who are the madmen, mad men or women pushing for this? What is this? What is going on? Um, Anna, the very last word, one minute goes to you. Yeah, and I think that, that that's a very good question, Pascal. Um, in our side, what would, what needs to be done? In our political system, uh, the foreign policy, the, the sole author of foreign policy is the president. That is constitutional. The, the, we cannot do it. We cannot avoid that because that's part of the constitution. So if you ask me what's the solution now for our foreign policy to go back to neutrality and independent one, and given the situation with Marcus Jr., I don't see him changing it really, to be very frank. He is like, he already is in a, in a cage. He is already caged by the... Deep state and the Americans, I think, when you talk about foreign policy and being pushed to accommodate all possible requests coming from the United States. And he has four and years left, five years left? He is. He has around four, maximum, uh, roughly four years more because it's his third sauna. So probably around three and a half years. And there's a lot of things that may happen in that three years time. OK, it's, it's really critical. So... If, if really you ask me, you know, I'm not sure if this happens, but from a very, uh, uh, from my point of view, if if things, if if foreign policy will change, if it has to change, there should be a change in leadership in my country. That's the only way to go. That is the starting point, change of leadership. And then from the change of leadership, a new leader that understand the dynamics and really want to be in the neutral position vis-a-vis -vis the geopolitical tension that's going on in the Asia-Pacific needs to rise up because that's the only way for my country to be saved from any kind of possible military outbreak or world war that would happen, that may happen in the Asia-Pacific region. I don't know. I, I really hope not. And also, that's the first step, really, from our perspective, from our context in the Philippines. And, and one thing that I want to say, this kind of issues, especially, like, for example, in the Asia-Pacific, this is not just an issue of the Philippines. This is an issue that all countries in the region has to take and has to listen and has to make some kind of contribution to prevent. Because if, like, for example, my country will be used as a pawn and it may turn out hopefully not into a next Ukraine and Asia Pacific, everyone in Asia Pacific will be affected. And this is not anymore just a regional conflict because the countries that are involved are really superpowers. That would include United States, China, and even Russia. And you have North Korea and you have also allies of these countries. And of course, the United States have its allies. The G7 will be involved. So I really hope and pray that these things will never happen. But again, the reality is there. And there's some kind of a force that is pushing this kind of military outbreak to happen anytime soon and I, I really am working also our our side are working up peace loving people like me are working to to have an advocacy on this and to a certain extent to prevent this from happening especially in our side of the world the Asia Pacific because Thomas is on the European side mm -hmm. <laughs> yes I have to add to this that they uh, Finland don't have an opposition anymore it sounds. Oh, we crazy. have. We don't also have an opposition okay. anymore. Okay, so we I don't, I don't know where the political leader comes from that could change this, but I think we should dismantle the whole parliament and uh, deny every current politician to take part, and then maybe we get something else. But there is a, uh, like I said, 
and like Anna said, there is a force pushing this. I think it has two parts. It has an, a, a local part, a national part, and then a global part. And they communi communicate like this yeah. uh, very jointly. So, and we, the people, need to have, need to start asking what is people, why are they pushing for this? This is like, we, we have to take our head out of the sand and acknowledge that our governments are really not our governments anymore. Something changed during the corona. And in Finland, you can see it really clearly. And I, I think in Philippines too. And the, our governments, it is not ours anymore. Who is controlling them? Why? What is happening? Why we are being dragged into a global war, which no one wants in the, you know, not, not, I don't think there are, there are not many people in the world who want it, but they are powerful people. Who are they? Why, why is this happening? I, I would agree with Thomas on that note, really. Yeah. Our government is not ours. It's not serving the interests of the country. It's not serving the interests of the people. And no rational person would want to have a third world war. I don't think so. I agree. We have to keep we have to keep talking about this, and we have to we have to analyze. I do think it's a sociological uh, uh, death spiral that we are in, and very unfortunate one. But there might be other things. My friends and colleagues, um, Anna Tuomas, thank you for your time today. Thanks. Thank you, Pascal.